Miracy. Having a strong culture, you've got more productive teams, you're more profitable, you've got less turnover. But the really fascinating part to me was the number one reason why somebody said they would leave an organization is that they didn't feel connected to their coworkers. I'm Sharon Richmond, and this is To Lead as Human. For more than 30 years, I've run a business called Leading Large. I help C-level executives have greater impact. After working together, they better clarify their priorities, energize their organizations, and build cultures of accountability and respect. In this podcast, we help you see how you can supercharge your own leadership by introducing you to real-life executives who lead with intention. These top business leaders exemplify the principle of leading large. They know that as leaders, the power of their position comes with an equal measure of responsibility. These leaders run successful organizations, delivering stellar value to their customers and clients and stakeholders, while they also prioritize building organizations that provide purpose, meaning, and a healthy environment for employees. We learn from the challenges and successes they've experienced on their human journey. My guest on the show today is Doug Campbelljohn. As you listen to our conversation, notice the differences and key similarities that Doug highlights between leading in a corporation versus a startup. Appreciate how he attains his fiduciary responsibility with his strong focus on shaping culture and catch the lessons we've each learned on how to be better listeners from our daughters. Doug is currently the founder and CEO of Airspeed, a platform that connects and celebrates employees digitally. He's a seasoned tech executive, most recently at Salesforce and LinkedIn, as well as an active investor and advisor to several early stage startups. Doug holds degrees in engineering and business from Carnegie Mellon University, and he's especially passionate about leveraging technology to drive innovation and improve people's lives and about the importance of culture in accelerating business growth. Doug's a frequent speaker at industry events and has been featured in publications from the Wall Street Journal and Forbes to TechCrunch. Welcome to the show, Doug. I'm so glad you're joining us today to share the challenges and insights you've gained along your leadership journey. Thank you, Sharon. Great to be here. Great. So to start with, maybe let's walk through just some of the roles that you've had as you've gone through your leadership progression prior to founding Airspeed. Yeah. So I graduated from Carnegie Mellon and became a product manager at Apple. It was my first job which I didn't even know existed as a career path, you know, when I was in school. And it kind of spoke to me because it was kind of like the blend between sitting between engineering and the customer. I really fell in love with it. So I just got very lucky there. So I was at Apple working on a project called QuickTime and a lot of multimedia stuff. Joined a bunch of startups, some of which worked out, some of which didn't, and then started a couple of my own. And the last one was acquired by LinkedIn in 2015. So I became the basically the head of the product group for Sales Navigator, which is a version of sales LinkedIn for salespeople, and did that for about four years. And then I was kind of bored and didn't have a startup idea yet. And Salesforce came calling and said, how'd you like to be general manager of Sales Cloud? So I started that in February of 2020. Ah, perfect timing. Yeah, perfect timing. So six weeks later, the world looked like this. We were all in line. And on the one hand, I loved it because I never want to go back to an office five days a week ever again, but I miss people. And I've, all the stuff they were doing to try to feel connection, I found just wasn't really working. It was scattered all over the place. And that's kind of where the idea for Airspeed came about. That's super. And so maybe let's think back over some of these roles and what were some of the leadership challenges that you faced that you think helped shape your leadership? Yeah. You know, I think that when you're a first time manager and early leader, it's easy to think that your job is to kind of control things. And I quickly learned it was the exact opposite of that. Right. I mean, I think really great leaders are ones who have good spidey senses about bringing in the right people, make sure that they're fully armed to do a great job and then basically get out of the way and then say, I'm here to support you. And that's kind of what I tell most people. So I do the culture presentation. I, I take great pride in that. And I say culture isn't about words on a plaque or, you know, anything like that. It's kind of who you hire and who you fire and what values you embody in those people. And so what we do is everybody who comes into one of my companies, we literally put a meeting on the calendar 90 days out. And we say, we're going to make sure we're going to do everything to make you really successful in the first 90 days. But you kind of know whether someone is going to work out or not within 90 days. So we kind of give ourselves a deadline, say, hey, if it's not working out, we'll say goodbye. Yeah, that's great. So 
as the leader, let's think about maybe I'd love to break it into two parts. Like in the corporate environment, I know some of the executive challenges are a little different than when you get into the startup environment. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what your experiences have been like, how they differ? Yeah. Coming from a 30-person startup to LinkedIn, which was over 10,000 employees at the time and still growing, was a very interesting challenge. And I think that the biggest lesson, and LinkedIn's got great leadership. You know, Jeff Wiener, who was the CEO when I was there, and now Ryan Roslansky and others are just fantastic people to work with. And I was amazed at how conscientious they were about cascading communications. So what Jeff would do is he would say the vision and the mission never wavered, right? We repeat that all the time. We would talk about plans for the year. He would kind of start with his executive team, cascade it to his top 200 plus leaders. Every two weeks, we'd have an all hands meeting, cascade that way. It was a very deliberate process to repeat things so that people can understand. And I think that was really a great lesson for me in how do you scale organizations and make sure everybody's aligned. Sometimes I find executives are sort of reluctant to go to those kinds of meetings. Did you find that at all? No. You know, I think great leaders are vulnerable, are human, are not saying they've got all the answers, you know. In fact, Tomer Cohen, who runs product for LinkedIn, has one of the phrases I most love, which is, I may be wrong, but I'm not confused, right? I know Tomer from business school when I was teaching there. So yeah, he's a fabulous guy. He's a great human. And I love that phrase because it's kind of how I feel, which is like, I'm going to have an opinion. And I know because I have the word CEO in my card, you may think that that I'm just right, but I'm often wrong. So please tell me or present me with facts. But if not, that's the direction we're going to go. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is there's just a lot more care and feeding to cascading communications to large companies. And I think we have to give the same amount of care and feeding and be as deliberate about cascading culture. You can't just assume people are going to run into each other in the cafe, the cafeteria anymore or the coffee shop or any of that stuff. You have to think about how do you onboard people successfully? How do you make sure they have a fantastic first week, first month, first 90 days? You have to make sure you're more deliberate about recognition, about getting people together. So all of those things are the things that we're, you know, I've tried to do in my companies. And now the software that we're building in Airspeed is kind of helping support that. And if we think for a few minutes about those listeners that are entrepreneurial and they're just building up their companies, maybe could you talk a little bit about what you noticed is different in leadership at the very beginning of a startup to the scaling stage to the expansion stage? Yeah, I think, as I said, culture is all about people. I often, someone told me once that the CEO's job is MVP, but it doesn't stand for most valuable player, stands for money, don't run out of it vision, make sure you have a strong one that everybody is aligned around, and people. And I kind of put those actually in reverse order. So there's kind of three tests that we have around the hiring. We have what we call the awesome test, because I've done this thing in the past where it's like, hey, everybody interviews the candidate and says, you go thumbs up or thumbs down or scale of one to five. And people tend to be nice, right? They're like, oh, that person, yeah, I'm sure they could do the job but you don't get the amazing people that way. So what we do is that person awesome, often with an expletive in front of it. And if you can't say, oh my God, we need to have that person in the company. I can't wait to work with them. Keep looking. So that's one. Two is how do you make sure in the crazy environment of the startup that the great people are engaged and happy? So I just will randomly ask people when I see them, I said, are you having fun? And I found people are really bad at lying about that, right? So if somebody's not having fun, their voice will go up an octave or they'll just pause and look up a little bit. And you're like, okay, something now is wrong. I've got to dig in. And then the last one is just, you know, you can't keep people who aren't performing. And this I just stole from Netflix, which is what they call the keeper test. And what you ask yourself is, if anybody on your team said they were leaving tomorrow, would you fight to keep them? And if the answer is no, you should actually manage them out now. And if the answer is yes, you should figure out what you should give them that would you be willing to give them to keep them and do that now? Yeah, I love your three tests. And in fact, I had a question for you about the having fun. So just recap for the listener if they missed the idea behind it. Why do you ask about fun? My view of work is that, you know, one is it's a significant chunk of our lives, right? It's if you're just hating it every day, right? You know, you should be doing something that you're passionate about, right? You're passionate about the mission the company's on, your passion about the people you're working with. And if you've got smart people kind of aligned that are having fun and trust each other, like the organization just flows like butter. It's amazing when that all comes together. So if somebody is not having fun, something's wrong, right? They're not in the right role. We're not giving them the right tools. We're overloading them. Something needs to be adjusted or maybe they're not the right fit. And fun doesn't mean like, oh, I'm playing ping pong every day and I'm working two hours a day. 
it means like, I really love what I'm learning. I'm passionate about this. And so that's why I asked the question. I love that as a strategy for quickly gauging kind of that employee satisfaction or employee engagement. And I think you're right. It's really hard to not tell the truth if someone asks you if you're having fun, because that's the kind of thing we usually only ask kids. And yet so much of what we ask kids is so useful at the workplace, too. Like, do you feel like you belong here? So I do love that. And I know one of the things that I've asked people in workshops when I used to teach more of those, I don't do quite that much anymore, but I used to ask people what makes a great boss. And they would often say one of the qualities of their best bosses ever is they gave them stretch goals, something to really strive for, and then supported them as needed. So I think this is something that's challenging in a startup, especially when you're in that product market fit stage, because everybody's scrambling. We're trying really hard not to spend too much money. We're wanting to make sure that the product we make is going to get traction in the marketplace. And a lot of times it leads to very long hours, product rework, engineering rework. How do you manage through that experience and how do you help people kind of keep their eye on the big picture when they might be feeling kind of exhausted? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, we try to keep meetings to a minimum. We don't have an office, so we actually spend all the money. We put everybody on a plane once a quarter and go somewhere fun. So we've gone to like Cabo and Park City and Vancouver and all these places. And we'll literally spend four days together where maybe six hours of that is meetings. And the rest of it is let's go volunteer. Let's go drink some beers. Let's go have some, you know, go on a fun activity. And those are great moments. We're still talking about product. We're still talking about the company, right? And getting a ton of stuff done. But we're also getting to build that trust layer, that connection layer, and that bond between us. So I care about the output. I don't care about whether you do it in two hours a day or 20 hours a day. And what I say to everybody is the only thing I ask is tell me if you need help. There's zero penalty points for telling me you're underwater or you don't know what to prioritize or you don't know how to do something. Zero. The only problem I have is if you're drowning, you can't keep up and you're not willing to tell me that because then I can't help you. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of my clients find that sometimes their younger employees are reluctant to do that. And so what do you do differently, would you say, that makes it easier to raise your hand if you're drowning? So I think part of it is just always to to have access, right? You know, I mean, you basically say to somebody, hey, listen, if you're having a struggle, first go talk to your manager, but there's no, like, come to me directly. Here's my cell phone. Here's my, you know, email, whatever, like message me on Slack. So you want to make sure that those lines of communication are always open. That's great. When I work with executives, I have this very simple leadership model that I use. I say, leaders have really three jobs. The first job is set a clear direction and make sure everybody has clarity. And then the second one is to engage and inspire, which is about energizing the organization. And that's where I feel like a lot of Airspeed's products work. And the third one is simplifying and accelerating delivery. And that's it. It's about it. In a startup, if you can do that and do it within the envelope of your spend, generally speaking, you'll stay out of the bullseye target of your investors and also out of the bullseye target of your employees. You know, it's funny. When I left Apple... And a friend who's now actually an investor had asked me, like, why would you leave Apple now? You're like on the top. And I said to him, and I, I've kind of figured out how to build products, right? I've got an odd sense of that. I want to go to startups and figure out how to build culture. And it was really fascinating being inside other people's startups and starting my own to figure out what worked and what didn't and what to avoid. This is great. Can we dig in there a little bit and talk about some of what you've learned Like, what do you need to do at the onset? And then how do you continue shaping? A lot of early stage companies think this is a waste of time and money early on. So how do you do it in a way that is not a burden on time, not a burden on expense, but gets to the heart of what really matters? Yeah. Again, you've got to have the right people. You've got to have the right vision. And I think that you also just need to, like, there are a lot of these, like, tiny moments that add up right? Yeah. So for example, in my old companies, we used to hire somebody and we'd take them to lunch and we had a set of like five questions, like what's your first concert, most embarrassing moments, something we'd be surprised to know about you, all this stuff. And it was great. It was like this great connecting moment. The problem was, A, that person never knew what the other people's responses were. 
And B, anybody who wasn't at that lunch, including future hires, never heard that person's answers. So one of the apps we developed at Airspeed is just called Intros. Super simple. Ask the same question. Somebody joins Slack. They immediately get a request to say, welcome to the company. Here's some questions to answer. They get to go answer those. It's posted to everybody. They get to see everybody else's answer on the team, and they get to know each other in a more efficient way. So that's an example of like how software can help something that we used to do in the real world. Yeah. And the company is entirely remote. We're remote. We're on five continents. We have no offices. What we decided to do is say, everybody's got a budget to go furnish their home office. Everybody's got a budget that if you want to go into a co-working space, you know, you need that kind of structure or you want to get outside of your house, you can go do that. And then we do these offsites once a quarter where we'll get together. As we scale, I imagine we'll have like pockets of people in cities. And what we've seen, for example, with some of our customers, we have another app called Maps that people love where you can kind of see where everybody's working. And you can say like, okay, I'm going to Chicago. Who's in the Chicago area? Let me go, you know, zoom in on that, message them and say, who wants to go grab dinner or grab a beer? So we use that ourselves. And I think as we start to see, you know, if we expand and we get those concentrations, we'll probably have budgets for people to do meetups as well. You know, that's such a great point. And it's interesting because I was with a client the other week and uh, there were a couple different people in a meeting and one of them said they're in L.A. And another person on the call was like, you're in L.A.? I'm in L.A. I didn't know you were nearby. So that seems like such an easy fix for the hybrid or remote companies. And maybe it offsets some of the worries that some leaders seem to have about not being in person and face to face. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I understand why legacy companies want people to come back to the office. They have done it that way. They are scared that employees are like not paying enough attention or might be doing side hustles. They're sitting on a lot of real estate, right? They're sitting on big leases that they're looking at on their balance sheet. Yeah. But I think, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. It's never going back, right? Employers view of hybrid work is come into the office these three days a week employees view of hybrid work is let me have the flexibility to decide when I come into the office, right? Give me a space. And the question I always ask is if we had never invented the office and we all worked like this by default, would we invent it? And what would it look like? I guarantee you, it would not be a set of cubicles where you come in and put in your headphones and jump on a zoom call, right? It would be much more like a community space where like there's food and there's coffee and there's big brainstorming meeting spaces. And like, there's a lot more of this kind of ways to have these casual interactions. And then people could decide that's valuable for me to go do. It's got to be an improvement upon working at home. And for a lot of people that commute and that like just sitting at my desk and doing Zoom calls is actually a decrease in the experience. Yeah, I think that's true. I read a pretty interesting article yesterday or the day before about what are people doing when they're working at home in those little interstitial moments that in between your meetings. And it's things that are, you know, kind of unpaid labor at home that usually you can't do until the evening, but like throw in a load of laundry or turn on your dishwasher. They don't take time, but it keeps your life flowing. And I do think, well, I've worked from my own home office for most of 30, 40 years. So I'm the wrong person to talk to about it. But as a person that really focuses on culture shaping, especially in early stage companies, I know a lot of people really are concerned about what do they lose when they're not face to face? Well, I have not found in my experience that productivity drops in remote work, right? And I think in some ways it increases and you have more balanced, happy employees because they can do the things like you mentioned, like the little things around the house. Airspeed's got a suite of six apps that are mentioned too, intros and maps, but they're all about these culture moments. It's really important to give recognition. Now, how do you structure that? So we oftentimes it may be something where I could give or someone on my team could give direct recognition, but they're like, you know what? It'd be even more effective if Doug did it. So they can write it all up and nominate me to give that recognition through the app. I can say to myself, you know what? I'd like to give out at least, you know, a shout out a week so I can give myself a goal and have a reminder coming to me in Slack to go do that. We have this Feel Good Fridays feature you can turn on and say, hey, now's a great moment today. Let's just like recognize the people on the team. So there's these kind of things that just help you do what's right. We have a Icebreakers app. I get an automatic notification in Slack the day before. I use the same question, but you can choose any of them and use AI to even generate other ones. So I spend five or 10 minutes in the beginning of the meeting and I suddenly know what's going on in people's lives. I get to see their kids. I get to see their dogs, a new house, anything they're doing. And it's just a great way for us to get to know each other on a personal level. 
we have celebrations, which a lot of times now people have these digital kudo board cards that are like chasing people around and saying like, sign someone's you know work anniversary card. We put that all on autopilot. So anytime you've got a work anniversary or a birthday, you can just kind of automatically route that in Slack. Everybody writes it and it's all just delivered on the final date. And then the last one we did is called Coffee Talk. And it's really the idea of, again, came out of my experience at Salesforce where I had this 60, 70 person team, most of whom I didn't meet on a regular basis. And so I just wanted to say, can you just schedule for me? I'll block some time off on my calendar, schedule for me regular meetups of these people I don't meet with in my regular meetings. And so Coffee Talk takes care of all of that. Yeah. And you just say, here's the kind of people I want to meet. Here's what I want to talk about. Here's how often I want to meet and what my availability is and takes care of the rest. And does it have like a randomizer in it just for that synchronicity of meeting people that you didn't think you might want to know? It does. It does. Yeah. So you can be totally random about it or you can be more deliberate. Like I just want to meet with people in the customer support department, for example. So you've worked with a, quite a few very financially successful organizations. And I know, and you have been today, a very vocal advocate for culture as a key driver of company success. Like for people that wonder if that's really true, what are some examples, some concrete things you could offer. I have a client who says he likes to hold things in his hand. Like what's something concrete that you could tell our listeners to help them understand what you've learned about why culture drives business success? Well, you know, we actually interviewed or had a third party interview about 1,600 folks, 800 kind of leaders and 800 individual contributors. And the stats were amazing. It was really one of these things where having a strong culture, having an engaged team, you've got more productive teams, you're more profitable, you've got less turnover. But the really fascinating part to me was the number one reason why somebody said they would leave an organization is that they didn't feel connected to their coworkers. So if you think about the cost of turnover, the cost of hiring, you know, that's the number one thing. And as I said, a lot of people took it for granted. I mean, there's different levels of leadership and people who just did it well naturally. But I think we have to be a lot more deliberate about it going forward in this new environment. So earlier you mentioned how important it is for vulnerability and leadership. And to me, I think one of the most valuable parts of our conversation today for a lot of our listeners is to explore a little bit some of your important moments of vulnerability and growing. And I wonder if you could share a story or two about some of the growing pains and what did you need to learn about yourself and what did you do differently after? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the most painful early things in my career was I was working at a company called Epiphany. And I'd actually introduced them to the firm Kleiner Perkins to go do their round. The Kleiner brought in their own CEO and the CEO basically fired a bunch of the executive team, including me. And it was the first time I'd been fired in my life. I was devastated. I complete loss, crisis of confidence. It took a while to go. Like I went off and consulted for a while. And then finally, like that turned into me starting my first company. And so I think it's one of those things where, you know, we grow through challenges and that's where all the growth happens. If life was just easy, it would be boring and, you know, we would just be at a plateau of where we are as humans. But I also think that one of the reasons we ask questions like what's the most embarrassing moment is being able to say, like, I'm a human being, I make mistakes. So I openly tell these stories about getting fired, right? Although some people would be like, it's too embarrassing to do that. I openly tell stories about like, I screwed this up. I'm very open to saying, I don't know but I'll find out, or that's a great idea. So I think it's really important to do that. I think just, you know, being vulnerable about your own foibles is really actually a strength. Yeah, that's a really great point. And I know you're a big proponent of sharing feedback as well. So in the spirit of vulnerability, what's the toughest feedback you've received as a leader and how did you respond to it? Good question. You know, I think that I am such a, for myself personally, like if you give me a review that says, here's 99 things you did well, and here's one thing you can improve on, I ignore the 99 and I only care about the one. And so I think the most valuable feedback I've gotten is like, people need to hear from you, Doug, that they're doing well, right? And not just hear when they're not doing well. And so to me, it's been a conscious journey. I think that was the hardest thing is like, I immediately go into problem solving mode, let me go fix what's broken. And I spend so much time, you know, paranoid about that and need to do more on accentuating the positive. It seems very common for a lot of early stage executives, I think, because we're always looking for what's the existential threat that's just around the next corner. And there are so many 
that it can be hard to remember that. Yeah. You know, I'll give credit to my youngest daughter. A few years ago, she said, you know, dad, you always try to solve the problem when I bring you something. And she goes, there's actually three things that you should think about. You should ask me, do you want me to solve this? Do you want me to just listen? Or do you want me to distract you? Right. And I think that actually applies in the business world as well. Sometimes people just want to dump stuff and release stuff. And you have to say, how would you like me to help? This is such a, you know, my daughter said the same exact thing to me. And she still does. She's like, mom, I don't need you to solve the problem. I want you to listen. I'm like, okay, but then what? And she's like, then acknowledge what I'm feeling. I'm like, okay, what does that solve? I feel heard. And I'm like, oh, genius. So yeah. It's at home, and it's certainly the same at work. I don't think it's different at all. So what would you say is your current learning edge as a leader? What are you working on these days? What do you think you might need to further improve in your leadership? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that scaling is going to be a big thing for me. Like I've done the, you know, zero to 30, zero to 70 kind of thing. I think we're on a path for getting much bigger than that and being a really successful, hopefully public company one day. And I think that there's going to be those stages that we go through that are going to be challenging for me. And I think that many entrepreneurs like go to do these different levels and they're, they're like, I'm not good beyond that. I mean, Reed Hoffman, who started LinkedIn or was a co-founder of LinkedIn, took that to like $80 million. And then he's like, you know what? I'm not a good operational executive. I'm like a product guy. And he eventually brought in Jeff, who took it to an $8 billion company. So that was a really good decision. Yeah. They're two really exceptional leaders. I have to agree with you on that. In my coaching practice, I focus a lot on helping executives go through this scaling stage, usually after product market fit feels pretty confirmed. So just given what you've seen over the different startups you've been in, what do you think your leadership challenges will be at your scaling stage here? Yeah, I had the good fortune years ago to meet the legend Bill Campbell. And to me, Bill is such a great example of somebody who is really helping people move forward. That's what I aspire to, because I think that an early stage startup, I love products. I love user interface design. I tend to spend a lot of my time doing that. And as we scale, I think I've got to let my hands off that wheel more and just spend time on the kind of Bill Campbell stuff. Thank you for that. The title of the podcast, as you know, is To Lead is Human. And I love to uh, ask folks, what does this mean to you, Doug? I think I love the title of the podcast, by the way. Thank you. I think great leaders are not somebody who is up on a pedestal. To me, leading is basically being human yourself and recognizing the humanity in others. Well, I want to keep talking for a long time. I feel like there's so much more we could talk about and there's so much more wisdom that we could pick your brain for. But out of respect for your time, I think we'll begin to wrap up. Just thinking back over the course of our conversation, do you have any kind of a particular reflection or thing you'd like to maybe share with our listeners as they're trying to figure out how do I become more successful and build this human-centered place? Yeah, I think, again, just be yourself. And like, I think the leaders who try to fake the like, hey, I've got this shit all under control. And it happens a lot sometimes with, with younger leaders and first time leaders where you're just like, my job is to like give everybody tasks to do or my job is to, you know, show that they can rely on me and nothing's going to go wrong. Just be human. Right. I think really come in and listen and pay attention and really try to remove obstacles for your people. Like everybody's kind of focused on getting their stuff done. So the best thing you can do as a leader is to say, I'm going to make your life easier. Definitely true. Well, I really, really appreciate you coming on today. It's a joy to meet you and it's been a really fun conversation for me. And I hope it's been insightful and inspiring for our listeners and that you gain something from it as well. So thanks for being here today. Thank you. And I'm going to imagine that people might want to find out more about you, where you are, what you're doing. What's the best way for listeners to stay up to date with you? Yeah. So they go to getairspeed.com. We've got a newsletter and a website for all of that, but I'm an open book. So if you want to email me directly, I'm just the letter D at getairspeed.com. Ah, that's fabulous. Okay, Doug. Well, thank you so much for being here today. We really are very fortunate. Thank you. Please stay with us for a moment, and I'll share some takeaways and a coaching tip to help you up-level your own leadership starting right away.
Duck brought a number of core lessons forward in our conversation, starting with the new leader's fallacy. That refers to new leaders or young leaders thinking that their job is to hand out the tasks, make all the decisions, and show folks that they can always rely on that leader and that nothing will go wrong. Of course, something always goes wrong. There's always something that happens unexpectedly. And Doug offers his antidote. Be yourself, build trust, partly by sharing your own foibles, your own vulnerabilities, by being transparent in your communications, and by always encouraging your employees to share their ideas and concerns. A second key lesson from Doug is shaping culture in your organization is largely the same in startups as it is in larger corporations, other than scale. And that's a big other. But it's basically creating moments, memorable moments, of engagement and connection. It's discussing the values that guide who gets hired and who gets fired. And it's lots of two-way communication, both listening and speaking. Listening to everyone's ideas with curiosity and speaking to ensure clarity, an energized organization, and focused accomplishment. The last thing I want to call out that I really appreciated about Doug's conversation today is him describing his own learning edge. And I think it's one that lots of leaders recognize, but it can be really hard to do. As the company scales, he's aware that he's going to need to shift his role from being that driver of problem solving to the company builder, the culture builder, and especially based on feedback he got to accentuating the positives when he provides feedback to others. In this regard, Doug's like so many tech executives. His analytical and problem solving drive so critical to galvanizing a team and ensuring aligned action at a certain point needs to be complemented by what Doug called the Bill Campbell stuff. Bill Campbell is a famous Silicon Valley coach, and some of the topics he promoted include building genuine relationships, fostering growth always, and identifying and helping resolve the often interpersonal tensions that predictably arise in fast-moving environments. If you're interested in learning more about Bill Campbell, you might enjoy reading a copy of Trillion Dollar Coach, a memoir of Bill's greatest teachings according to some of the executives that he coached. So here's the coaching tip from today's episode. If you tend also to be one of these people that is more task-oriented, problem-oriented, and you find that you need to shift to a more appreciative approach, you do this by cultivating the art of asking great questions. What's a great question? Well, it should be open-ended, not something people can answer with a yes or no. It should come from genuine curiosity, and it should, and this I think is the hardest part, invite insight. So for example, instead of giving someone feedback like, great job on that last project, you might try including a question. Something like, I'm sure you had to do more than is obvious to reach that project success. What was it like for you behind the scenes? As you do this, you will learn more and more about your employees, how they think, what they care about, and that will improve the relationships and will help them grow. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm Sharon Richmond, and this has been To Lead as Human. You can find out more about me at leadinglarge.com. That's L-E-A-D-I-N-G, large.com. To Lead as Human is part of the Miracy FM Podcast Network, which also includes such shows as Making It and Soul Savvy Business. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Melissa Deal assembled the episode, and Marvin Del Rosario was the audio editor. Danny Eni is our executive producer. If you learned something today, make sure you don't miss upcoming episodes by following us on Miracy FM's new YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast player. If you did find something valuable, take a minute and leave us a starred review and spread the word to your colleagues as well. The more leaders we can reach, the better we will all be able to lead with full humanity. Thanks so much for listening. And I'll see you next time on To Lead as Human.